At that time, when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, sending two of his disciples, he said to him, Art thou he that art to come, or look we for another? Words taken from today's Holy Gospel in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Sloth is one of the seven deadly sins. Sloth, sometimes called acedia by the desert fathers, acedia, can most simply be defined as not doing what you're supposed to be doing when you're supposed to be doing it. Not doing what you're supposed to be doing when you're supposed to be doing it. Sloth keeps us from fulfilling our duties in life. It manifests itself not only in laziness, lying around doing little or nothing, but also in doing lots of things, too many things apart from our duties. In other words, a workaholic is slothful. He is not doing what he is supposed to be doing when he is supposed to be doing it. Instead, he's doing everything else to avoid some duty he finds distasteful. Also, curious people are slothful people, looking into what is not their business. All this is indicated in the old English word for sloth, namely, slow with. That's where sloth comes from. Slow with, meaning someone is slow to do his duty. Now, St. John the Baptist, the forerunner of our Lord, a man of great virtue, more than a prophet, an angel sent from God, was certainly not slothful. He fulfilled his duties to perfection from his earliest years. And we know he was unjustly arrested for speaking truthfully and dutifully about what? Holy matrimony. That's what he was under arrest for. That was why he was going to have his head chopped off. He spoke about true marriage. In this way, St. John acted as a forerunner, even in his death, for his majesty's future unjust arrest and martyrdom. His disciples, however, seem to have fallen into sloth. How can I say this? Well, St. John told them in so many ways what they were supposed to be doing, namely following the Word made flesh, the Lamb of God, the Savior. He would cry out, Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me there cometh a man who is preferred before me, because he was before me. Next Sunday, we will hear in the gospel, St. John say, I am not the Christ. In other words, St. John told everyone who would listen, follow the Lord. I'm not the Lord. Don't follow me. Follow him. It seems his own disciples were making the great St. John into a sort of cult of personality. In their minds, he was the man to follow. In order to break down this unhealthy attachment, he said things like, he must increase and I must decrease. Ever protesting that he was not even worthy to unloose the shoes of the Savior. So, St. John was where he was supposed to be, arrested in prison, acting as the forerunner. Think about that. He was where he was supposed to be, arrested in prison. He was doing what he was supposed to be doing, suffering and preparing for martyrdom, for the glory of God. These disciples of his, however, were not doing what they were supposed to be doing. Thus, St. John used a new tactic to motivate them, to help them break from their sloth and redirect their cult of personality toward the divine person, the Word incarnate. 
he wisely sent them to his majesty, seemingly on his behalf, to ask, Art thou he that art to come, or look we for another? In this way, he wonderfully overcame their resistance and redirected their goodwill. Now, I bring this up because modern man is very slothful. There are many cults of personality today, sad to say, even inside the church. But more to the point of this Advent season of preparation for Christmas, we often find that the gifts people give actually encourage slothful behavior rather than discourage it. Thus the reason for this sermon In other words, many are giving gifts that distract and detract our loved ones from their duties of their state in life, from their vocation. These distractions usually come in the form of some electronic device, some form of recreation, but not necessarily. It might be immodest clothing, bad books, frivolous or worldly games. Sad to say, this Christmas, people are buying Ouija boards for their loved ones. Many, if not most, gifts are given for the sake of recreation at this time. Concentrate here. Think about it. Most of our sins in the past, of our youth, have they not been during times of recreation? Amusement, entertainment. Think of all your sins in your life and you'll find that most of them come under that heading. They were done in a time of recreation, entertainment, amusement. Once again, thus the importance of this sermon. Now, in order to avoid any confusion in this matter, let us lay down a few principles. Recreation is a virtue. It's part of the natural law. The way God made things. Thus we must recreate and we must relax to some degree in order to maintain our mental and physical health. Just as the body is fatigued by manual labor and demands the refreshment of sleep and the recuperation afforded by days off or intermissions from work, so also the mind cannot be healthy or active unless from time to time it is relieved by some kind of amusement or diversion. Thus, St. Thomas teaches that moderate recreation is a virtue in that it seeks to renew the body and the soul, to allow them in some way to be recreated, to be refreshed. Mao Zedong, the world's worst tyrant, responsible for over a hundred million deaths. It's hard to get your mind around that. He had to learn this the hard way in the late 1960s. He initiated a cultural revolution in China wherein he attempted to wipe out nearly all forms of recreation and amusement. Books, plays, operas, parks even, artwork, everything. It had to go. He wanted output. He wanted productivity, work, slave-like obedience. He demanded a cult of personality. He was the man to worship. Mao Zedong. After a few years, the results were disastrous. Productivity dropped as well as quality, while the people suffered from a multitude of mental and physical illnesses. They skyrocketed. The incidences of face twitches and nervous behavior became a daily common sight in various regions and cities of China. These poor people suffered a sort of shell shock. We spoke of last Sunday on the lack of proper recreation. Yes, we need to recreate. We need to relax. But, uh, but this must be in moderation and according to reason, especially if fallen man is so inclined to take it easy and be slow about things, slow with, about practicing virtue. 
For recreation to be a virtue then, it must always be moral and pure. Meaning it should not cause the person relaxing to lose self-control in any way. Thus, right reason, prudence, must govern the amount of time, the persons involved, and the circumstances. Think of it like this. When we recreate at the right time and in the right place with the right people, we are within a certain fence, a certain circle, protected by God's grace. We're doing what we're supposed to be doing when we're supposed to be doing it. As a result, sloth has nothing on which to grab hold to bring about sin. As long as we stay within the boundaries that God has marked out for us, we will be refreshed. We will be renewed. On the other hand, when we find ourselves getting arrogant, angry, lustful, curious... These are signs we have moved outside of the boundary designated by God. We have exceeded a reasonable recreation. We're overdoing it. Thus, St. John Climacus, the desert father, says, Sloth approves of worldly ways. Now, parents, think about it. Is it not true that most disturbances in the home between the children come from excess in recreating. Usually children get angry at each other when playing. Most people fall into some addiction, even lifelong addictions, when they stumble across something immoral in their curiosity or while seeking to be entertained. What is more, many if not most tragic deaths, this is true, Most tragic deaths in the West happen when people are recreating. Either they're on the way, happens during, or on the way home. I think of all the people I know from my life, from my youth up, that died tragically. Almost all of them died in recreation mode. Either on the way, during, or on the way back. You think about that. Tragic deaths. All this adds up to say we in the West are slothful to the extreme in this area. With the majority falling into excess outside the proper bounds. Demanding to be entertained even under their dying breath. And others use recreation to get people away from them. Here, go over there and play with that and get away from me, okay? Is that really the right way to think? We're using entertainment, amusement, playing in the wrong way. It's going to lead to problems. Thus, recreation can easily become selfish, vicious in a number of ways. Sometimes the entertainment is improper in itself. For example, it's impure, it's immodest, containing various obscenities and blasphemies. Oh, don't worry, Father, it's only got a few bad scenes in this movie. That's improper recreation. Second of all, sometimes the disposition of the person himself is sinful. He's seeking it simply for selfish pleasure, making it its chief occupation and goal in life. Rather than a form of recreation so he can fulfill his duties. Third of all, sometimes the circumstances make an amusement unsuitable such as recreating with the wrong person. Bad company corrupts good morals. Think back on your life. Think of all the sins you've committed. Is it not true that they usually got started because you were hanging around the wrong person and they introduced you to sin? You'd have never known about that stuff if you hadn't been around so-and-so. Being around people acting like buffoons is unhealthy. Men and women playing wrong parts of a play or in a movie, that's wrong too. It's unhealthy. Don't hang around those kinds of people. But it also might be the time that it's a problem. It's the time to pray, not to play. It's time to go to Mass. It's time to do our homework. 
or do our other chores. It's not a proper time to be playing. It's time to go to sleep. It might be the wrong place. A church is not a place for recreating. It might be the thing used itself, making jokes, using the scriptures. That's not recreation, that's sin. It might touch on the quantity, spending lots of time and money on things for recreating. Movies, sporting events, sporting equipment, fancy motorized equipment, trips, making all these trips. People have all these entertainment centers in their homes, but no chapels, no little oratories. Thereby they leave little left for the works of justice and charity. Again, keep in mind that when we recreate well, we will be refreshed. We will be uplifted. We'll be renewed, ready to take up our duties once again with determination and virtue. When we recreate in excess, we end up feeding our passions and waking up depressed, walking away more disturbed than when we began. A good seminary I know of had only one or two days off for each semester. Sometimes they visited a shrine, a museum, or some natural wonder. One time they went to a large metropolitan science center. At this place they attended an Omnimax theater that is sort of a dome that takes up all your vision, including your peripheral vision, and it plays these IMAX films. So it's like you're inside the film itself. The film showing that day was Everest. A documentary about climbing Everest. The film itself was breathtaking in its imagery, but dismal, dismal in its message. Some of the climbers entered pagan temples to light their candles for good luck. Superstition. During the filming, a group of climbers died on the mountain. One of them was a husband with a wife back at home with baby in her womb. He left them because he had to go climb a mountain. And he died. Sloth. The main character of the documentary was just married with his wife at the base of the mountain on their honeymoon. Sloth. Those who did reach the summit had to step over the recently dead bodies. Is it surprising that many of the seminarians complained of headaches after leaving the film? It made them depressed, made them sick. On another day, the same group attended an opera put on by the local university. It was the Dialogues of the Carmelites which wonderfully retold the martyrdom of the 16th Carmelites of Compiègne, whose death ended the 1793 reign of terror in Paris, France. The performance was outstanding. The modesty of the actresses was superb. All left uplifted, praising and glorifying God. You see the difference In the one, the characters were climbing a mountain out of self-love and were slothful, even to the extreme. They paid the price. In the other, the Carmelites climbed a much bigger mountain, the scaffold of the guillotine, and died for the glory of God and the salvation of souls, even as they sang and chanted hymns and psalms. The one is selfish, depressing, death-dealing, The other, even as death came, brought life and joy and refreshment. It ended the reign of terror. And we can glorify in it to this day. Surely, the disciples of John must have felt something of this in meeting with His Majesty. And hearing and seeing all that He was doing. The blind see. The lame walk. The dead rise again. Miracles Our God's creating power at work in our world. They edify the faith. They recreate our minds. We should be reading the lives of the saints about the miracles they worked. 
That's a good recreation. On Christmas, the shepherds will come away from the manger, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen. Notice they didn't stay there all night. They had to go back to work. They were edified, though, and recreated. Here, then, is a hint of how to recreate. We should do what they did. Recreate together with virtuous people at the proper time and place. Not seeking personal entertainment. Movies and personal devices are really not very helpful here, are they? As they are normally not communal and they're selfish, feeding the passions. In days past, virtuous recreations came from edifying books being read out loud by somebody in the family. They read them to each other. Or they told good stories as they went on a walk together. Or sometimes they put on little plays for each other. Sometimes they played musical instruments or played board games and so on. Did we not love to have books read to us and stories told to us when we were children? That's how we fell asleep. Why not do that now? Families should recreate together, not by watching some condensed and often deeply flawed movie of a real story or a novel, but read the real thing little by little. This encourages healthy thought and discussion, making us look forward to the next time we're together. Might I suggest some books even? Father Raymond's The Family That Overtook Christ. If you've not read that book, read it as a family. It's a wonderful book. Mark Twain's Joan of Arc. The biography of Leo Dupont, the holy man of Tours. These are excellent family books that edify and recreate the soul rather than feed our passions. If we cannot read these sort of books ourselves, others have done it for us. You can actually find them read. Then listen to them together. You can find them read online. They're available. It'd be a great Christmas gift. Well, in this way, our families will be climbing the right mountain, seeking true refreshment with Christ and his saints. The one that leads to virtue, to true refreshment of mind and body, where sloweth sloth is not allowed, and curbs are put on curiosity, and sin is kept under control. Let us keep these principles about recreation and sloth in mind as we prepare for our Christmas gift giving. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.